Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here with Manga Monday, and then a couple Western comics after that. So this is volume 13 of Pokemon Gold and Silver. I wasn't sure if I liked the Gold and Silver arc as much as the first seven volumes, the red and blue story arc. Uh, now that I'm approaching the end, I'm really quite enjoying it, and I'm willing to extend my recommendation for the first story arc to the second story arc as well. What's really neat about it is I think that uh, Hidenori Kusaka has an ability to tell a complex story that isn't convoluted. I think a story becomes convoluted when motivations don't make sense or things happen that contradict things that were established earlier. And what Kusaka's good at is having lots of things going on at the same time and a pretty sizable cast of characters, but he keeps it simple enough by basically giving each character one thing that's important about them or one thing that they really want. So when all these characters are fighting each other or competing with each other, uh, it's there's a lot of them, but it's not that hard to, it, it's easy to keep straight because you, you can simplify all of these characters to like one really clear goal that they're going for, one really clear personality flaw or strong personality trait. Uh, so let's let's hop in and flip through it a little bit. Uh, I guess uh, note number one is, uh, like the previous volume, this is kind of uh, rated PG instead of rated G. There's like a, one of those classic uh, guys and girls in the hot bathing spring uh, springs scenes, which I guess is a little bit more normal in Japan. It doesn't show like a butt or anything, but it's kind of like a slightly sexual gag. It's, it's still in kind of like a PG, you know, no, no, nothing too inappropriate territory, but just parents be aware. So uh, neat thing number one is Red, the first protagonist, uh, after the end of the last story arc, was basically permanently injured. And uh, he was good at hiding this, but this was clearly something that uh, was bugging him or getting at his confidence in himself. He was someone who prized himself on being a really good athlete and his injury basically was preventing him from being an athlete anymore, which uh, works in the Pokemon world and it connects to like a real human drama problem of athletes have a very short uh, shelf life usually. Like this is true of dancers, this is true of anyone who's in a really physically demanding uh, career. And so Red's basically trying to take a break and heal himself. While that's going on, uh, Gold and Silver uh, and Crystal are sort of the rising new generation. And uh, Hidenori Kusaki is also doing something really fun, which is playing with toys. He does, he does a really good job of playing the Pokemon games and studying the details of the games for lots of inspiration and lots of creative ideas for the fight scenes. And he recognizes that he has like a wide a, a big cast of characters he can potentially work with so he has like a giant tournament arc with lots of uh battles going on quickly and you know none of these characters like are shakespearean or anything but they're all given their own like little flair or a little individual drive and vibe and so when they compete you have you get a chance to let some of these attributes come out like some of them want to catch a legendary pokemon some of them are trying to like redeem themselves from their time when they were uh, criminals, some of them are older and more experienced, some of them are younger and scrappier. So uh, as this tournament is going on, behind the scenes, uh, the evil Mask of Ice is hatching some sort of uh, foul, foul plot behind the scenes. Uh, Silver was basically enslaved by Mask of Ice, so he's hoping to uh, take, take out his whole organization. And uh, Green, who is an original character from the first arc, has like a childhood connection with Silver where they, where they were both enslaved by the same guy. Uh, hopping forward, so Blue, uh, Red's rival from the very first story arc. Uh, everybody has a little issue or a problem in their life, and everybody's given their own little moment in the sun. Blue is defeated by Red in the last tournament, so what's he gonna do with himself now? Well, now he's trying to become like a gym leader and make, make something of himself. So he gets to fight one of his old teachers, and his old teacher, Chuck, had this philosophy that it's not enough for you to just order your Pokemon around. You have to train and improve yourself as much as possible, which is a philosophy that's really inspired Blue's way of fighting. Uh, there's also some neat stuff like Blue sometimes has different Pokemon teams in the game. So they actually come up with an explanation for why he changed his team. He wanted to start fresh and keep himself sharp. So he trained a whole new team of Pokemon to cha change things up. Now, uh, 
gold, gold and crystal team up. They kind of have like their, you know, Han Solo and Princess Leia, you know, uh, slightly romantic teasing. And they think that the, the evil guys are planning to take over the tournament. And uh, suddenly the train with the bad guys takes off. Well, what's going on? Well, the plan wasn't to take over the stadium the, the whole time. The plan was just to lure the gym leaders, the powerful trainers onto the train station and then send the train away to get to get to take them out of the picture. Then the big bad shows up and look, he's got two legendary Pokemon. What a badass. This is like every 10 year old is freaking out because these are such cool Pokemon. And even if you haven't played the games, these two Pokemon have been set up as like really epic, really formidable foes. And he's got both of them at the same time. So that makes him like super duper cool. All of the experienced trainers are gone and it's just crystal and gold on their own trying to handle this. Uh, desperate situation. So it leaves off with them kind of like barely hanging on and barely holding their own uh, against these two. And uh, apparently the big bad mask of ice, he's got some plan to kidnap this guy and force him to help him uh, find a way to, I don't know, manipulate time or something. We don't really know what the big bad's plan is yet. Oh, one more cool thing that Kusaka did. So because he thinks about like every step of his plot, uh, one of the things he thought about is setting up the mystery of who is this Mask of Ice character, which means that he set up red herrings. So one of the red herrings is one of the old guys, uh, Price, is an ice Pokemon user. And the mysterious Mask of Ice guy, well, he uses ice Pokemon. So is Price secretly uh, the Mask of Ice guy? Well, I guess not. Apparently, apparently not. It was a really good setup. He even had the kids uh, speculating that Price might be the guy, and that was their working theory until... We find out, okay, it's not Price, so who could it be? I, I hope it's somebody. That, that That's what you would think, right? That we're setting it up for, for it to be someone really cool who we would never expect. But uh, basically what Kusaka is good at doing is, in addition to writing action scenes, he's also good at... Uh, building up every little step. So if somebody has an evil plan, they sh he shows you like a couple little steps of the evil plan at first. You're thinking, okay, maybe this is their evil plan. And then he reveals the evil plan so that it all logically make it all logically makes sense. So once you go back and read it, you can see premise A, premise B, conclusion C. It's not uh, premise A, upside down logic, conclusion C. What? What does that have to do with that? It, it doesn't make any sense. So it lets him get away with goofy stuff like, oh, he's got some plan to manipulate time or or something. And, and I'm willing to accept it because he's done such a good job of building up uh, each of his simple little characters step step by step. It's really, I, I kind of want to do a video just on like how he constructs plots because I feel like I haven't seen too many manga authors this good at constructing their plots. Like the famous one would be Akira Toriyama, Dragon Ball Z, who would literally forget about characters he created until like a lot of his characters became jokes where why are they even there? They don't, they don't serve any purpose. And Kusaka just manages to make every single character who appears have some sort of use or utility. Gold's a little bit more uh, feisty and gung-ho. Crystal's a little bit more knowledgeable and uh, ha has good foresight of the situation. So even though they kind of tease each other in that, you know, stupid brother-sister way, they make a great, they make a great duo. So I uh, am looking forward to the final volume, uh, and this is confirming my opinion that this is one of the best uh, children's series uh, ever, ever produced, and easily it's perfect children's entertainment, but so well constructed that I think that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, older readers and writers could take notes on how Hidenori Kusaki very, very carefully looks at his source material for inspiration. Was I going to go somewhere else with that? Uh, I think maybe like my last point is Pokemon is a big idea franchise. The big idea is cool monsters fighting each other. And so it's obviously such a successful franchise because that's such a cool idea. Once you get a cool idea like that, you want to stay true to the core appeal of it uh, while maybe adding, you don't want to change the core appeal. You want to add your original ideas to a franchise with a core ap appeal. I feel like a lot of Pokemon debates these days are on whether the new games are trash or not. Like is the new, are the new Pokemon games sort of losing touch with what made the old Pokemon games good? I haven't played any of the new Pokemon games, so I'm kind of out of that debate. But what I really respect about Hidenori Kusaka is he looks at the universe, he gets excited by it, he's clearly a nerd about Pokemon, he understands what's appealing about it in that it's like, hey, 10-year-olds, do you want to go on an adventure with cool monsters? 
and fight bad guys. Yes, I want to go on an adventure with cool monsters and fight bad guys. And then he adds his very careful thinking to making it all work. So that's volume 13. Now let's take a look at a couple Western comics real quick. Uh, this is a double feature free comic book day book. And the first story is Critical Role uh, Vox, Vox Machina Origins. I think Critical Role is like a D&D or like pencil and paper campaign channel. And I don't play d and I know there's some kind of like weird debate going on in d and between like older school d and players and new school d and players. Uh, since I've never played d and I'm just kind of like completely out of that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to evaluate uh, this comic as a comic all by itself with no knowledge of the source material or the pencil and paper role-playing game world. So my main problem is it seems to assume you care about the YouTube channel. And I'm sure that these characters have something to do with like the campaigns they've played on the YouTube channel. So it's got a framing device of some ordinary Joes talking about the heroes who saved the world and just having a chat. Well, yeah, it's like, it's good. I'm glad these guys saved the world, but you know, they're kind of troublemakers, right? Like you don't want heroes saving the world unless it's a really desperate circumstance. And they tell a couple little stories about what these heroes got up to and then someone says oh well you know those heroes have also killed a bunch of guys too and then this all leads up to the mysterious guy walking off and setting up the big bad guy so the problem is i don't know anything about these heroes and what they've been up to and this seems to like allude to all of these events and things the heroes have been up to as if i know what's going on and have some sort of connection to this the framing device is pretty good of just like a few ordinary joes having a chit chat about, you know, what the crazy D&D heroes have been getting up to. Uh, but I, I just don't know enough about the heroes basically to care. The second uh, story is, oh, uh, one last thing on the art. I kind of like the art. It's very clean. Uh, and I'd say it adds, it's a Western style where they bring in just a little bit of, not the manga style, but maybe kind of like the glamorous aspect of manga where they have like a lot of pretty boys and you know very very sharp features uh it's very clean and consistent and uh it, it looks good it's, it's not exactly my thing but I, I i can't deny that it's very professional professional and clean and i think it would appeal to the target demographic uh uh, where I, I enjoyed this one a little bit more. Neil Gaiman's North Mytho Mythology. Neil Gaiman, I kind of think, is a bit... Uh, what, what's the word for Neil Gaiman? I think Neil Gaiman's a bit of a swelled head. Like, got successful in comics, managed to make the transition into uh, the regular, like, novel publishing world and drops his matter-of-fact uh, hot takes on Twitter with his blue check marks. So, however, I do kind of respect that Neil Gaiman is very considerate of mythology, uh, things like American Gods. He, he, he's someone who I think is very famous for seeing a connection between classic mythology, like Norse and Greek mythology, and modern superheroes. And so he kind of writes about superheroes through the lens of ancient gods and their myth. Uh, this first little story just seems to, I don't know anything about Norse mythology, but it just seems to be Neil Gaiman's way of retelling uh, elements of Norse mythology and their creation story. Uh, and P. Craig Russell, who I just read his uh, adaptation of the, the Giver, R Russell seems to have like a really good ability to adapt his style. So in The Giver, he had a slightly more realistic 3D style. In this, he has a more 2D stylized style. And uh, Lovern can... Uh, What's, how do you spell that? Kinzierski uh, does like really good symbolic colors. So, you know, in Norse mythology, there's lots of fire and ice. So hot and cold, you got to represent that symbolically in color. If you did these with like a billion colors and a million shades, it wouldn't work. This works because it's, it's light blue, it's bright red and orange, ice, fire, cold, hot. It's really easy and identifiable. That's symbolic thinking with color. Uh, since I don't know too much about North, Norse mythology, I can't comment on how accurate it is, but it definitely feels like Neil Gaiman is just taking details from Norse mythology and trying to represent that. Uh, it's not like a modern take on the Norse gods. It's like, oh, what if the Norse gods worked at a cashier or something? And, it, and it's not uh, a Marvel style of the Norse gods either. I feel like Marvel just took the Norse gods and inspiration and said, okay, let's turn them into superhero superheroes. Why not? And then just fit those characters right into the tone of their world. This is clearly Gaiman wanting to do the Norse gods 
all by themselves as as the Norse gods without any of those other kind of like modern associations with the characters. So a pretty neat setup. I would be definitely interested in checking it out more. Uh, Neil Gaiman's hot takes on Twitter notwithstanding. I feel like I've reviewed this issue before. I, I buy like giant stacks of these to give away. So I'm sure I've bought the same issue multiple times. It's a reprint of X-Men 129, written by Chris Claremont, uh, art by John Byrne, inked by Terry Austin. Since I think I reviewed it before, I just, I reread it again and I love it. This is such a great era. This is kind of the era when the X-Men were to American comic readers, what My Hero Academia is to Zoomer manga readers. It was the thing, like all the kids were talking about it. The cartoon was on TV. The cartoon was so cool. And the comic matched the tone and the fun of the cartoon. This is a little bit before the cartoon came out, but uh, tonally comics were com getting more complex. They had more, you know, adult themes in them, but tonally you could still read it as a kid. You wouldn't be horrified by the subject matter. It had a fun sense of humor to the whole scenario. So I feel like this is sort of like the gold, uh, there, there's the golden age of comics from the golden age of comics publishing. What I mean, So when I say golden age, what I mean is I think this is when comics really hit their stride at finding a good balance between some adult themes for the old, older readers, but a general sense of fun and teamwork. And uh, you know, there's even like a subplot where Wolverine feels grouchy because Professor X comes back and treats him like a little kid and he's a grown man. He doesn't want to be treated like a little kid. Like simple little plots about teams working together to save the world and having, you know, team dynamics issues and teenagers learning to grow up and deal with their powers kind of like as a metaphor for growing up and dealing with uh, problems in life. And John Byrne is just What's neat about John Byrne is I, I see him as a master, but he's a master who will occasionally just have like a really bad face or two for some reason. I don't I don't know why, but it, like we, it's again sort of like the uh, similar to like the manga artist who's just like a really good master, and then for some reason just has an awkward face every now and then. It's like oh they're human they they don't get everything perfect, but the overall quality and. Uh, just drama and emotion of everything is so perfect. It, it, it really is a, a, a master of the craft who sometimes just makes a little mistake here and there. So I, I actually appreciate that aspect of it. Fantastic era of comics. If you're a Zoomer manga weeb, check out the Chris Claremont, uh, John Byrne era of X-Men. You can skip all the other X-Men. Just start with John Byrne and Chris Claremont and you're going to have a really good old fashioned time. All right, that's our review. Next, we will see the end of the gold and silver manga. And I'm actually open to suggestions if you have ideas for what I could read next. I'm thinking about going ahead and getting, uh, since I really enjoyed Pokemon Gold and Silver, maybe I'll just pick up Pokemon Gold, uh, Sapphire, and Ruby and just see how long does the series stay good? Does it stay good the entire time? Is it all is it all this great? Or I'd be open to suggestions for new series for me to check out. So let me know in the comments if there's anything you want me to review and I'll go try to dig it out, dig it up. If it's not too expensive, I'm poor. Oh, I got to go to the library again and continue and, and continue that. There's so many comics to, to review. Anyway, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. I'll catch you later.